Well, we're in a series that we're calling The New Normal. And in this series, we're looking at the church. And if you haven't figured it out yet, we're not quite sure exactly what the new normal is going to be like. We know it's not going to be exactly like the old normal. It's not going to be completely different than the old normal, but we're going to try to figure that out together. But, those, but that principle actually runs through the Bible and particularly the New Testament. The church is never changing, but it's ever changing. In fact, we're going to look, look at a couple passages from the book of Acts today, and you're going to, going to discover church is very different in Acts than it was in the Gospels. Things change, right? It's ever changing, but never changing. The priorities are the same, but things are different. They're continuing what Jesus started as we continue what Jesus started, but they continue what Jesus started differently because the context is different, the situation is different. Well, what we're gonna do is we look at Acts, we're gonna go from principles to practice. We're gonna go from looking at what the building blocks are to how they get lived out in that early church. So before we get there, let me remind you of the principles. And maybe you haven't kind of walked with this uh, carefully through. The principles kind of hang together. So here are the principles. The first thing we noticed when we started the series is that Jesus promises to build the church. I will build my church. He's the architect. He's the general contractor. He designs it, and he's the power behind doing it. Jesus promises to build the church. No human being human beings or obstacles can thwart Jesus building the church. The church will be built, it's in process, it's being accomplished just according to Jesus' plan. But then we looked at a verse from the Old Testament that reminds us that anything successful, anything of a spiritual nature is gonna be done by God, not done by us. And so we read that principle, it's not by might, It's not by power, not by human might, not by human power, but it's by the spirit that things are going to be accomplished. Jesus is building the church, but he's going to build it through his spirit. His spirit's going to transform, energize, and gift people to then build the church. After that, we looked at um, some of the difference, the transformation that the spirit brings. Remember our five words? Um, In the spirit, we're qualified, rescued, transferred, redeemed, and forgiven. Those are things that Jesus accomplished and the spirit applies. So Jesus did all that stuff. The spirit then takes all of that work that's been finished and he applies it to our lives and makes it real for us. In the next couple chapters in Colossians 3, we read that that means we put off and put on. So those interchanges of being qualified, redeemed, forgiven, they work themselves out by putting off a whole bunch of stuff, the way we used to live and the things we used to do, and we're putting on new things. Old behaviors, attitudes put off, some new behaviors and attitudes put on. That's part of the transformation on the outside, inside to outside. Last week, Carlos looked at a couple of verses from 1 Peter in which we were told that All of Jesus is building the church. He's doing it through the spirit as he transforms people, but he doesn't transform us to live isolated, disconnected lives. We are built together into a spiritual house. We together as transformed people come together to build a house acceptable to God. The language there has to do with a temple. So, you know, Jesus doesn't now dwell in a temple. God's not in a temple. His people, right? Those that have been transformed and are energized by the spirit. We are the temple. Jesus occupies his worship in the temple and through the temple reaches others. So those those are five principles we've been working with so far. Well, how do they get left out? Like, how does that work out? What does that mean? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We got a real simple outline because we're going to look at two chapters. So you look at the screen, Acts 1 and Acts 2. They're not short chapters either. Some of you are thinking, Man, when are we going to get out of here? Not that long. Real simple outline. Here's the outline. Up and down, in and out. You got that? Now, we're not going to do gymnastics or aerobics today. And we're not becoming liturgical where you're up and down. We're not doing that either. Up and down, in and out. If you can remember up and down, in and out, you want basically understand Acts 1 and Acts 2. Acts 1 is all about Acts 1 and the beginning of Acts 2, up and down. The, the middle and end of Acts 2, in and out. Up and down, in and out. You got it? Up and down, in and out. You got the two chapters. And in those two chapters, you're going to see, hopefully, those five principles lived out and practiced 
in that early church, and we need to figure out how we're going to implement them and practice them as well. Well, Acts 1 begins with up. It's all about up. Jesus ascends. You know, we talk a lot about Acts 1.8, and you see it on the screen. You'll receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you by witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. But right after that, in Acts chapter 9, we read about Jesus going up. Here's what it says. After he said this, so right after Jesus said, hey, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right after he said it, he went up. He went up. That's called the ascension. Now, I know uh, in, in lots of churches, maybe churches that we're familiar with, churches that we've been part of, we don't make a big deal out of the ascension. You ever notice that? Like Roman Catholics make a big deal. Like they, they name churches Ascension. Maybe some of you went to an Ascension high school or elementary school. Um, Episcopalians, they like Ascension. For some reason, like we don't talk a whole lot about Ascension. But if Jesus is building the church, we need to understand something about Ascension or we're not going to understand how the up and the down affect how we're going to do church. So let me just very quickly say a couple of things about Ascension and you can study on your own. When I think about ascension, I primarily think of three things. Now, again, you can't separate Jesus' life into little compartments, right? It's one life. Here are the pieces. Birth, life, death, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. One life. We can't parcel it out. One's not more important than the other. It's all part of one life. It's one unit. But the ascension is often left out. Here's what ascension means to me. First of all, intimacy. And some of you are thinking, Charles, you're nuts. How in the world can ascension mean mean intimacy if Jesus goes away? Going away is the opposite of intimacy. Listen to me for a minute. There's a really weird passage in in, um, John chapter 20. Some of you may, uh, may have read this passage before. Let me tell you what it's about, and you tell me if you think it's weird. Mary Magdalene with the other women... They go to Jesus' tomb. He had been crucified. It's early Sunday morning, the first Easter morning. They get there. The stone's rolled away. Jesus isn't there. The women are freaking, right? Mary, oh my goodness. All of a sudden, Jesus appears. Mary can't believe it. She's overcome with celebration. She then like tackles Jesus, right? She's holding, in my mind, she's holding onto his leg. I'm not letting you get away this time. You're never leaving. I'm going to hold on to you forever. You left for a few days. I almost couldn't take you. I'm holding on. You know what Jesus says? Here's the weird part. Mary, Mary, stop clinging to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. Like, what? Um, Here's what I think the point is. Mary, if I stay with you the way I am right now, the way I was during the past few years, if I stay with you that way, you're going to lose your grip. You're going to fall asleep. And when you fall asleep, your arms will fall off. You're going to have to go do different things, and I may have to go do some things. And so if things remain the way they are, we're not going to be together, right? There are going to be times when we're absent. But Mary, if you let go of me with your hands, I will come into your heart and never leave you again. You see, that's the, that's the up and down part, right? So Jesus says, Mary, when I go up, ascend, I will send my spirit. He will come into your heart. Mary, you're going to lose your grip with your hands. But when I ascend, I'll send my spirit and he will grip you and never let you go in your heart. See, that's intimacy. We talk about the intimacy language all the time, right? Jesus is in our lives. We feel Jesus' presence. Well, it's actually Jesus' spirit that we feel. Jesus gives intimacy in the ascension. Oh, here's another one. Sovereignty. Now, look, I know the Bible says God is sovereign. Jesus is sovereign. But um, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus goes up. And, you know, can you imagine being one of the disciples? And you ever see a little kid with a balloon or a helium-filled balloon with a string? They, they, they like to let it go. Right? And then they complain. When, and you see the balloon. Well, Jesus has gone up. And the disciples are saying, well, you know, we should have held on to the guy. What, what's going on? The op, in my mind, the opposite side of Acts 1, earth picture of the ascension, is in Revelation chapter 5. 
Revelation chapter 5 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 5, we're, we enter the throne room, right, through the Apostle John. The Apostle John's where he, we kind of enter the throne room. And John's really depressed. John's distraught. John's discouraged. Because the Father had just said, the King of the universe had just said, who is worthy to open the scroll? Now, what's on the scroll? The victory of God. What's on the scroll? The redemption of, of God's people. The vindication of everything about God. That, that, that's in the scroll. And nobody can open the scroll. So John's all discouraged. And so one of the angels says, John, cool it, right? Cool. Somebody's able to open the scroll. And John turns around and he sees the lion who is the lamb. The lion of the tribe of Judah, that's king of Judah, who is also the sacrificed lamb. And all of a sudden, the attention in Revelation 5 now turns to the lamb, and the lamb approaches the throne and says, I'll take that scroll. And the lamb takes the scroll and begins to bust open the seals. And the rest of Revelation and the rest of human history happens because the lamb is unrolling God's victory, unrolling the plan. That's sovereignty. You know, oftentimes people will ask me, Charles, why do you think this happened? I don't know why stuff happens. But I do know who's in control of what happens because the ascension tell, teaches us about sovereignty. The ascension teaches us about intimacy and sovereignty. Oh, and there's one more, and this is one you need. Right? I need it, but, and you need it. I, I may need it more than you, but we all need it. Advocacy. You ever feel like you need an advocate? An advocate is somebody who comes alongside of you to make up for what you lack. If you're weak, you need an advocate that's strong. If you're stupid, you need an advocate that's wise. If you're guilty, you need an advocate that'll pay your debt, right? You need an advocate, somebody to come alongside of you and make up for what you lack. The ascension speaks of advocacy. Now, I didn't put up verses from John 20, and I didn't put up verses that talk about sovereignty from Revelation 5, but you need Hebrews 7. Let me read these couple verses to you about Jesus' mission advocacy today. Writer of Hebrews says, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, ever, he is a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Now look at this. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Isn't that good? I don't know about you, I don't only need Jesus interceding for what I have done, I need him interceding for what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do this week. And I like screw up fairly regularly, and therefore my great confidence is not in my record, my confidence is in Jesus continually interceding. And sometimes I figure I'm wearing him out, right? Um, he's continually interceding. That's part of his mission. So when I think about Jesus' ascension, it's all about intimacy. He's now in us, working through us. Sovereignty. He's unrolling history according to God's plan. And advocacy. He's continually interceding for us. And that brings us right back to the principle. Jesus is building the church. He's the architect and the general contractor. And if there's no ascension after all of that mission then there's no way we're able to build the church. Jesus is the advocate. He's the sovereign one. He's the one who is intimately living, relating to us. That's the up part. Now, based on the up, he sends the spirit down. So right, the verse right before verse nine in, in Acts one is Acts eight. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus goes up, the spirit comes down. That's the point. And the whole point in Acts 1, 8 there is, you will receive power when the Spirit comes. Power and influence. You know, in, in that one little verse, and you see it lived out in the rest of Acts, I think we have one of the most radically countercultural points in all of the Bible. Certainly for our culture. Right, here's what I mean. We live in a culture that says... Our problems, our really big problems, are all out there. Isn't that right? In fact, if we were to take a survey, when you came in, we didn't do this because we didn't want you to feel too bad. If we were to take a survey, 
What are your biggest problems in them? My biggest problem is my boss. My biggest problem is my spouse. My biggest problem is my kids. My biggest problem is my parents. My biggest problem is my finance. Our, our biggest problems are out there. We live in a culture that says the solution is in here. Isn't that right? Just follow your heart. Whatever you think is right. You've got everything you need inside of you. Trust yourself. Trust your wisdom. Trust your. Um, the problems are out here. The solution's in here. That's what our culture says. The gospel says the exact opposite. You see it in Acts 1 8, and it runs through the rest of the book. Our problems are in here. We're our biggest problem. I'm my biggest problem. The solution is not in here. The solution is the spirit that's out there coming to me. That is radically countercultural. Isn't it true if you really think about it? Our biggest problems are in here. My biggest problem is me. But God brings the solution. Jesus ascends, so the spirit descends. The spirit brings the power, the solution to influence, to give us the power to change those things inside and solve those problems. So what are the principles? Jesus is building the church. There it is, Acts chapter 1. He does it through the Spirit, Acts chapter 2. It's all over the place. Without those two, without that promise and the means, we wouldn't need Acts 1 and 2. Well, that brings us to the second part of the outline then. In and out, in and out. Up and down, in and out. Now, there's a whole lot we could say about in and out. You know, in and out, by the way, that's not a burger joint from California. They have good burgers, by the way. Uh, but that, that's it's not in and out burger. This is in and out. It's the rhythm of the church. The church comes in, the church goes out. In fact, you don't only find it in the New Testament, you find it all over the Bible. God never sends you out before he first calls you in. And once God calls you in, he always sends you out. It's kind of like breathing. In and out, in and out. That's the rhythm of the church. Um, we gather together on a Sunday morning. We gather together in different contexts. What do we do? It's kind of like going into, um, into the pregame meeting, right? We're in the locker room. We don't live in the locker room, though. No. You go and live, then you go out to the playing field. In and out, in and out. That's the rhythm. Well, I just picked one verse. So we did Acts 1-8 primarily. Let's do Acts 2-42 as the in and out verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Lots of commentators, lots of biblical folks, they've all said those are the four marks of a church. The apostles' teaching, fellowship or community, breaking of bread, communion, and uh, prayer. You can't have a viable, healthy church without those four things. You need four marks of the church. But you know what uh, you may have missed before? That's that verse 42 follows verse 41. Can you believe it? What happens in verse 41? Well, in verse 41, 3,000 people hear the message that Peter preaches. They repent of their sin. They come to Jesus and they get baptized. Then it says they. The they is not the apostles. The they is not the disciples. The they is the 3,000 from verse 41. It's the three, this is the follow-up program for the 3,000. These believers aren't left to, these brand new believers, they're not left to their own devices. They're, they, they're brought into the community. They're taught the scripture. They're building in the community together. They're celebrating communion and they're praying together. It's the follow-up program for the 3,000. That's what 42 is. Well, let me take a couple minutes just to mention, we're not going to do much, just mention each of those. The first one, scripture. Now, I know if you think about it for a second, you get this. <laughs> but when Acts 2 was actually happening, and when 242 was being written, the only scripture they had was the Old Testament. So they're not talking about like Galatians, you know, Revelation now. They're talking about Genesis, Malachi. That's what they're talking about, scripture. What is the apostles teaching then? Well... I encourage you sometime this afternoon or whatever, sometime the rest of this, read through Acts. We're going to be in Acts for the next couple of weeks. Read through. The apostles' teaching is illustrated in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches, and what's he doing? He's an apostle, and he's teaching. Here's what the apostles' teaching is in a nutshell. The scripture, all they have is the Old Testament at that, at that point, has a point and a purpose. The point is Jesus, and its purpose is to lead us to him. What does Peter say in the sermon? 
The prophets, and he mentions Joel. I'm not sure how many of you are up on Joel stuff. The prophet Joel prophesied about Jesus. David is all about Jesus. The historical books, the Pentateuch, the prophets, they're all about Jesus. And all they had was the Old Testament. The apostles' teaching was taking all of the scripture that they had, the Old Testament, and they're explaining how Jesus is the point and the purpose. Now, we've got a big advantage over the 3,000 in Acts chapter 2. We have the apostles' teaching from Matthew to Revelation. So you can sit and read the apostles. And, you, know, you didn't have to go knock on the apostles' door and say, hey, I got a problem here. Give me some teaching because I'm supposed to kind of get, dedicate myself to the apostles' teaching. Are you free tonight? Um, no, we've got a Bible. But we gather together and we look at the scripture the way the apostles did. Jesus, the point and the purpose. The second thing there is community. Now, I know the word says fellowship in the verse. But the word fellowship has come to mean in lots of churches, coffee and donuts. Right? And some of you are thinking, yeah, by the way, where is the coffee? You know, look, if things are opening up, I need my coffee. I don't know how many times I said, Charles, when are we getting the coffee back? We couldn't even be in a room without noodles and everything else. And we're saying, where's my coffee? It'll come back someday, right? Maybe. Um, but it's not fellowship in the sense that we've gravitated. The word community is a sharing in common. They share life. They share things in common. And right after verse 42, if you read like 43 through 45, you'll discover they're sharing everything in common so that no one in the community has needs. If somebody had a lot, they'll sell some of their stuff so those that are in need won't have need. After all, these people traveled from all over the known world to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Well, they didn't bring all their stuff with them, so they're kind of running out of resources. Well, those that had resources there in Jerusalem are putting some into play for the people that traveled to Jerusalem. They're sharing. They're sharing things in common. Why are we doing all of these connect events this summer? Because of community. We need to connect with God and be impacted by him. And then we need to connect with each other. And in some weird way, as we connect with each other, we connect with God. And as we're impacted by each other, we're, con- we're impacted by God. And then we go connecting with others. It's kind of a cyclical deer here. That's amazing how God did it. So we have connection events like corn, cornhole isn't just to have competition and eat hot dogs. Um, all these barbecues are not just to get together and eat ribs or hamburgers. All of these events in, in August, not just for us to get together and have a good time, even though we hope you do that, it's to build community, to share life in common, do things in common. Why are ABF starting back up? Why are home groups back on track? Well, because we need to build community. Well, the next thing, uh, the breaking of bread, I'm going to call that Christ. And some say, Charles, it doesn't say Christ. This is breaking. You're messing up the words already. Um, but here's what I mean by that. The breaking of bread speaks of communion, right? Where Jesus said, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured, of the new covenant poured out for you. But then what does he say? Do this as often as you take it in remembrance of me. And then we're told by Paul to recenter our lives based on remembering. So communion is all about remembering what Jesus did and recentering our lives around what he did. So communion is really a Christ initiative. So we interpret the scripture with Christ as the point and the purpose, community with Christ at the center, and we remember and recenter regularly based on what Christ did and continues to do through his people. And then lastly, prayer. Prayer. Do you know what prayer signifies? And I know as I look around the room, I see some of you are really great at prayer. You spend time and energy and, you know, we really appreciate you. Others of us are not real great at prayer and we need to get better at that. But you know what prayer actually signifies whenever we pray? Prayer signifies two things. Prayer is a recognition of our weakness, our ignorance, our inability. And it's a recognition of God's ability, God's wisdom, and God's power. You wouldn't pray to God if you didn't think he could do anything about it. And you wouldn't pray to God if you didn't think he needed his help. So it's an acknowledgement that we have lacks and an acknowledgement that God is willing and able to supply those lacks. And so prayer is a recognition of the fact that God is God and we're not. And we come in submission humbly to him, asking that he would cover our lacks and give us what's needed. Community. 
in, in for scripture, community, Christ, prayer. Well, where's the, where's the outcome from that? Well, it's kind of all over Acts 1 and 2, right? Remember how, how we started from Acts 1 8? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You'll go out. We go out to, where are they going? Well, they're going to Jerusalem. They're going to all Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. What's happening in the beginning of Acts chapter 2? They're going out. Peter preaches to thousands of people. He's going out. They don't conceal the message or keep the message to a really small group of people. They go out with the message. I was thinking about this uh, the past couple of weeks as I was thinking about Acts chapter 2. Did you realize, do you realize that the first Christian sermon, Acts chapter 2, the first Christian sermon was preached to the nations at the same time. There, you read it. There were people in Jerusalem, Jews from all over the known world. They come to Jerusalem because it's Passover and they're all there and they come to worship. And it's at that time, God orchestrated the events so that it happened when all people from around the world are in Jerusalem. And when they're there, the people from the nations have gathered together and the first sermon isn't to one people group, it's to the nations at once. Oh yeah, here's a better, here's a better one. The first Christian sermon is given in all the languages at the same time. And so no language, no culture, no geographical location has priority over another one. That's part of the idea. The apostles, right, they speak in other tongues. The first message to the nations at the same time and in all the languages at the same time. No nation, no culture, no language has priority over any other. Level ground in Christianity. Well, there's one other thing I want to say about this going out. We talked about Jesus going up and the spirit coming down. That's kind of two of the principles. We talked about the transformation that happens and that we're qualified and we're rescued and we're redeemed and we're transferred. And we talked about the put off and put on. We're talking about how he's building us in community. We talked about all those five principles. But I don't want to end without showing you a specific example of that radical transformation that the gospel brings. Who preaches that sermon in Acts chapter 2 where 3,000 repent and are baptized at the end? Who preaches it? Peter does. Peter does. Now, Peter's a pretty famous character, right? I mean, if you read through the gospels, he's like all over the place. He's probably the most visible disciple. And Peter's probably known for two things through the gospels. Here are the two things he's known for. He's known for putting his foot in his mouth. He talks before he thinks. He's and he's known for being a coward. He says the wrong thing at the wrong time, and he's a coward. Push comes to shove, he denies he knows Jesus because he sees what's happening to Jesus. He doesn't want that to happen to him, so he denies that he even knows him. He's a coward, and he doesn't know how to speak. What happens in Acts 2? He preaches, and over 3,000 people find their hearts dissected before God They repent of their sins and are baptized. Peter courageously stands before multiple thousands of people. Remember, just a few weeks before, he was scared to death and denied he even knew Jesus. Now he stands before thousands. Many of them were the ones crying for Jesus to be executed. He's not fearing for his life now. He says, and I want you all to know, there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved, other than the name Jesus. Courage, eloquence, from the coward who couldn't talk right. Transformation. Up and down, that's how the principles work out. In and out, the rhythm of church. They did it differently in Acts than we saw it happen in the Gospels. They probably did things and will do things a little differently than we'll do them. But those are the questions we we wrestle with. On the basis of Christ's life, death, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Spirit, how do we experience transformation in and then out in our community? How do we connect and impact? Those are the questions that we need to answer. That's part of the reason 
We're having Connect Sundays every first Sunday. Or excuse me, Impact Sundays. Third Sunday, Connect Sunday. Lots of opportunities for us to connect and impact as we live out the principles too. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this description of the early church trying to figure out how to take those principles and make them live in the community. Lord, thanks for the up and down that remind us this is Jesus' work from beginning to end. And thanks for the in and out that tell us the rhythm that we gather for scripture, we gather for community, we gather for Christ, we gather together for prayer, and we do those things apart and we do them together and we go out together and separately. Lord, help us to... uh, Faithfully understand the up and down and faithfully live out the in and out as we try to live out the principles in the 21st century here at Calvary Church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.